Lord. I pray that you have your Bible with you this morning. I want you to open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 8 this morning. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, as we have a time for a branch inspection. Nobody knew there was going to be a test today, did they? A time for a branch inspection inspection. Let me read this story to you real quickly. A farmer once planted two trees on the opposite sides of his property. He planted one tree to provide a cover or a hedge from an unsightly view of an old landfill, and the other he planted to provide shade and rest near a cool mountain stream which ran down beside his fields. And as the two trees began to grow, both began to flower, both began to bear fruit. And so one day the farmer decided he was gather, going to gather the fruit from the tree nearest his house, and that was the one used to provide a hedge from the landfill. So as he brought the fruit inside the house, he, he noticed that it was a little deformed. The, the symmetry of the fruit was not very good, but he, he still took the fruit because it looked edible. Well, later that evening, while sitting on his front porch, the farmer took one of the pieces, took his old pocket knife out and he cut him a piece off for a piece of a snack while biting into that fruit he he found it to be extremely bitter and it was completely inedible casting the fruit aside he looked across the field to the other tree over by the mountain stream and after walking across the field the farmer took a piece of the fruit from the other tree and he bit into it and he and he found that fruit to be sweet He found that fruit to be delicious, so he gathered several more pieces of that fruit and he took it inside the house. See, the fruit was greatly affected by the nutrition of the root. And just as the tree by the landfill grew to be bitter and the tree by the stream produced sweet fruit, people also have a choice. People also have a choice. See, we we can either put down roots into the soil of the landfill of freshly, of fleshly pursuits or into the cool, refreshing stream of who Jesus Christ is. And when I read this story this week and added it into this sermon, the last part of this is what really affected me the most. Listen to this. This is what this says. We must understand that the branch bears the fruit And the fruit of the Christian is the outward evidence of the inward motivation. What motivates you? Well, what motivates you comes from what? It comes from the heart. What motivates us comes from the inside. Now, most people probably have never been asked this question in your life. Maybe you have. But has anyone ever looked at you and said, what kind of fruit are you bearing? Now, somebody may look at you and say, man, you smell good. What kind of perfume are you wearing? Maybe somebody comes by and they smell you. Wow, what kind of cologne are you wearing? Maybe you've been to the Mexican restaurant and you come by someone and it's like, well, I know where you've been. Amen. <laughs> you smell like a fajita. Praise God, right? So there are times in our lives where people may look at us and, and they may have a, there may be a distinct smell, there may be a distinct odor, Lord, I don't know, but how often has anyone ever looked at us and said, you know, what kind of fruit are you bearing? And whether you are a Christian or not, you are bearing some sort of fruit, and the fruit that we are bearing is determined by our inward motivation. How important is fruit bearing to Jesus? You know, Austin's talking about the same exact thing in our children's sermon this morning, in their time with our children this morning up there as well. We're talking about the same exact thing. Does it matter to Jesus what you and I are rooted in? Does it matter to Him? Is the fruit that we bear a genuine reflection of whether we are truly saved in Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you some things I want you to really ponder on this morning, church. 
I want you to really ask yourself this question because every single one of us that is honest, we know over the last year, many people have struggled spiritually. We know over the last year that a lot of people's inward motivation has changed. But does it matter who we are in Jesus Christ? Does it matter what we are rooted in? What does Jesus say about this? And if Jesus did a fruit inspection of each of us this morning, what type of fruit? Or let me ask you this. Or lack of. Would Jesus find on your branches? I think it matters. Amen. And I think it matters a whole, whole lot. Let's look at what the Bible says. John 15. (coughs) Excuse me. 1 through 8. Listen to the word of God. He said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will become even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Jesus says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and it withers and such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and they're burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much what? Fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day that you blessed us with, Lord. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together, Lord, and worship. And Father, you've already opened our hearts this morning. We thank you for Brother Billy. Thank you for the choir. Thank you for the music. Thank you for Austin coming this morning with our children's message. And Father, now as we come to to this time in our service, God, I pray that you bless these words. Father, I pray that when people hear me preach, Lord, they, they hear truth and they hear what you want coming from me. And so, Father, I pray this morning as you open our hearts and our ears, Lord, let these words not fall uh, on deaf ears this morning, Father. But, Father, help us to focus just for the next several minutes, Lord. Help us to regain our, 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 our heart for you, Father. I pray that we regain our zeal for you, Lord. Father, we know that we have been hurting. Father, we know the church has kind of been drifting over the last 12 months. But, God, I pray that you will reignite our flame. Father, I pray for a great revival that will sweep our country, our state, our counties, God. Lord, help people to see why they need Jesus, who Jesus is, and what Jesus can do for their families, for their lives, for their jobs, for all these things, Lord, that they are involved in, Father God. And so, Lord, this morning, as we talk about this branch inspection, Lord, let us be honest with one another. Let us be genuine with you, because, God, you already know if we're hurting If we're misleading, Father, if we're not genuine, Lord, you know the truth. And so, God, this morning I pray that you're already at work and that, God, your work this morning will bring glory to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, said, Amen. Now, before we go any further, I want to explain a little bit of some Old Testament imagery that's found in verse 1 as Jesus called the vine of God, so often described in the Old Testament in such books as Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and even Hosea. And so the Old Testament scriptures, they frequently use the vineyard or the vine as a symbol of Israel, God's covenant people. However, the vine's purpose of existence was to bear the fruit of its owner. And there are numerous times that Israel failed to produce good what? Good fruit, which in turn God issued judgment, also being called or viewed as the vine dresser or the gardener. But here in John's gospel, it's Jesus that's the vine and not Israel. And the disciples, the followers of Jesus, they are pictured as the what? They are the branches. So now with the coming of Jesus, here is Christ as the mediator or the true vine, and he's standing between the Father and the branches as this kind of mediator 
of life. And this is where your sermon outline comes in this morning, folks. So I pray that you have it open and you have a pencil, you got a pen. So here's what Jesus points out very, very quickly in our text this morning, verses 1 and 2. Branches are inspected and treated by who? And the Father what? Alone. Branches are inspected and treated by the Father. Jesus says these words. He cuts off every what? Every branch. And verse 5 lets us in on who these branches actually are. Jesus tells the disciples, he says, you are the what? You are the branches. Those in Jesus Christ, those that have been saved, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, you are the branches. And verse 2 indicates that these branches were in me. They were in Jesus So the branches were those that followed Jesus, but there's a problem, church. There is a problem. So you can follow something, but never put your heart or your complete trust in it. Amen? This is what we see. And it's very likely that in the days of John, during this preaching, there were churches that had a number of people who identified as Christians, but they were not genuine what? believers. And the same situation and problem occurs today. Many people come to church, they step foot into the church, they even act or display Christian action, but they truly aren't in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, as Jesus was speaking these words to the disciples, he knew there was one that wasn't in him, and his name was what? And his name was Judas. Judas was identifying himself as a follower of Jesus. Judas had been with Jesus over the last two and a half to three years. But Judas was in this for his own what? His own gain. Judas was in this for his own pleasure. So then Jesus says the father or the gardener, he performs (coughs) two jobs. And I want you to notice these two jobs. He says this, the father cuts off every unfruitful what branch and these branches that are cut off were at one time supposed to be attached or in Jesus but they did not bear what they didn't bear fruit matter of fact there was a time in their following of Christ more than likely when they listened to the gospel More than likely, they made a profession in Jesus Christ. More than likely, they were baptized and appeared to be fruitful. But it was superficial. It was counterfeit. It was momentary change. And it wasn't a lasting change. Brother Donnie, what are you trying to tell me? Are you trying to tell me these were people that lost their salvation? That's not what I'm telling you at all. I'm telling you these are people that were playing church. I'm telling you these were people for a moment they thought that following Jesus was the cool thing. I'm telling you these were people for the moment they were playing church, but they never had a heart what? They never had a heart transformation. They looked like church. They act like church. They did the churchy thing. They sat in the pews. They may even gave their money, may have gave them their time, but something in their life never changed. These are the people that come to me. I've been saved for five years, but pastor, my life has not changed. I've been saved for 10 years, 15, 20 years, but my life has not changed. I'm the same person that I was before Jesus, that I am now 20 years later, and I'm supposed to be in Jesus, and then I I ask you the question, are you bearing fruit? Well, what does that even mean, preacher? Your life's not changed. Brother Don, are you asking me to question my salvation? I'm asking you to be honest with yourself. Because God already what? God already knows. He already knows the truth. 1 John 2, 19, the Bible says this. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. What does that mean? That means we can fool each other, but we cannot fool the Father. We can fool each other. 
but we cannot fool the Father. And then number two, the Father does what? He prunes the branches so they'll be even more what? They'll be even more fruitful. So if the unfruitful branches were removed because they did not bear fruit, then the fruitful branches needed to be pruned because God wants us to even be more what? He wants us to be more fruitful. More fruitful. You know, I learned a long time ago that even the fruitful branches can sometimes develop spots. Amen? And leaves that are bad and useless. Even the most dedicated Christian has areas and issues that can sometimes arise. And those areas and those issues need to be cleaned up. Well, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, I'm going to get personal. You ready? Here it comes. I've been, I've been waiting for 12 months. It's coming. The boldness is coming. As the further we go, it's coming. I'm going to talk about areas of commitment. Areas of commitment. This is places sometimes many of us lack. Behavior. Preacher, what do you mean? Now you're, now you're dilly-dabbling. Now you're getting in my personal space. Your behavior. It's not fair to this world that we act one way on Sunday and then we act like the rest of the world Saturday through the next Sunday. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to your family. It's not fair to your church. It's not fair to your Savior. And it's not fair to the people that you come in contact with each and every day. Because they're looking at you and they're saying, well, there's nothing special about you. There's nothing different. You act the same th way I do. You talk the same way. You do the same things. You and I are exactly alike. There's nothing different in your life. But, oh, yes, I go and I praise Jesus on Sunday. You know what they call you? Hypocrite. And then I get that story. Well, Brother Donnie, I'm not going to church. Why aren't you going to church? Well, because the church is full of hypocrites. And I look and say, well, there's room for one more. There's room for one more. Many times when our lives are hurting and our lives don't seem to be going in a good and healthy direction, it's because we have let the world decide who we are. We're not bearing fruit for Jesus anymore. We're just kind of coasting what? We're just coasting along and we think to ourselves, well, I'm going to do what makes me what? I'm going to do what makes me happy. And if Jesus, if you want to come along, you are invited, but don't make any waves. And church, I'm talking to us. Because this is what we do. And then the people that we come in contact with are so discouraged and, and they don't understand. Well, I thought there was supposed to be something different about who? About him. I thought there was supposed to be something different about her. Our relationships, our passions, our motives, our habits. Sometimes we have to take a long, hard look in the mirror and say, Jesus, what, are you, what am I doing that I don't need to be doing? Father, what am I investing in that's not bringing you glory? Is there some change that I need in my life, God? But the purpose of the pruning is onefold. God prunes so we can bear more what? So we can bear more fruit. And the bearing of fruit is supposed to be continuous, not just a one-time experience. And many Christians, and you all know I'm telling you the truth, we fall into these gaps. And we'll come and we'll say, well, for five years I served in the church, and then ten years I took a vacation. For ten years I served God in the church, and then I took a 15-year vacation. Well, Brother Donnie, I used to be so involved in the church and serving God, and it just got old. It just got tired. I just got burnt out. How do you get burnt out on a Savior that gave his life for you? When did you ever make the decision that, God, I'll only produce the fruit that I want to do. Don't tell me what to do. Church, are you with me? If you have air in your breath, Jesus is not done with you. Amen? I don't care how old you are or how young you are. You can be a witness. You can be an example to anyone that God places in your path if you can still breathe. If you can still talk. He's not done. 
And did you know this? And I didn't know this. But did you know fruit trees have to be pruned every year? And usually you do it during that dormant stage, right? And if you don't begin proper pruning early in a tree's life, the result is alternate bearing. I didn't know this. Which means that one year's harvest is bountiful while the following year's is puny. I didn't know that. Does the Father want our fruit to be bountiful? Or does the Father want our fruit to be puny? Who are we? Are we bountiful? Or are we puny? And then number two is this. Branches are not what? They're not self-sustaining. Branches are not self-sustaining. Great example. Right there. Leaves are not self-sustaining. Now, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but if you leave today and you look in the front of our church, one of our small trees in front of our church became uprooted about a week or so ago when we had the ice storm and the snow and all the nasty weather, and it's falling down. It's kind of just leaning down. On Wednesday, Madden was at church with me. And so we, we walked outside, and I compared the tree that had been uprooted that was no longer sturdy in the soil to the other small trees that are standing around it. You know what I found? The tree that had just been uprooted not hardly a week ago had already become a little bit brittle. The coloration in the tree had already changed. And without the proper nutrients from the soil, guess what's going to happen to that tree? It's going to die. It's going to wither. Jesus, he looked at his 11 disciples because Judas had already walked out. And he told them, you're already clean because of the word that I spoke to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. See, there's a common theme in our relationship and our walk with Jesus. And that common theme is to remain. It's to abide. It's to be steadfast. Jesus knew that his crucifixion was very, very close. He also knew that once he was gone, that unbelief would set in. Depression would set in. Anxiety would set in. So the remain in me, it had a present urgency as well as a future urgency. Jesus wanted his disciples and his followers to hold on and to remain. So what does Jesus, what does Jesus want us to hold on to? What does Jesus want us to remain in? Well, the first one is an asterisk on your outline. Christians are to hold on to the what? The word. Christians are to hold on to God's what? God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible tells us this, all scripture is God what? Breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Church, I'm going to let you all in on a, on, a, on a secret real quick. Are you ready for this? Part of the issue that we're having today in the world and within the church is that we've quit putting such a heavy emphasis on the Word of God. Now, this is this the truth. Paul warned Timothy of this very issue. And we're seeing it today. 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want them to hear. See, that's what's going on in our culture today. People want to change the Word of God to fit the culture. People want to change the Word of God because it doesn't agree with their lifestyle. So instead of the church having an influence on our culture, the culture is now trying to have an influence in our church. Church, what do you stand for? Well, we don't know. It changes weekly. What does the Bible say about this? Well, we don't know. We'll ask the culture and then we'll get back to you. And so people now are becoming more confused than they ever have. 
Isaiah once said, if you don't stand for something, you won't stand for anything. We have to remain in the Word of God. The Bible is the same yesterday, today, and what? And forever. Jesus told Satan, he said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So when someone says, well, what does the Bible say? Well, let's make it even more personal. You ready? (coughs) When someone comes to you and they say, well, James, what do you think about this? Can I tell you something real quickly? It really doesn't matter what James thinks. What matters is what God thinks. What matters is is what the Word of God says. So what I think has nothing to do with what the Word of God says. And church, hear me. When man's Word and God's Word conflict, and they are at a mighty pace, amen? Always go with God's what? With God's Word. So Christians, we got to hang on to the Word of God. Secondly, Christians got to hold on to His love. And see, I want to tell people something real quick. You can love people and not agree with people. Amen? There's Cat fans in here, Card fans in here, Central Harden Bruin fans in here, LaRue County Hawk fans in here. We can all love each other without having to agree. Amen? But we got to hang on to His love. We have to love Him, the Bible says, with all of our heart, all of our soul, and with all of our what? And with all of our mind. If I came around to each and every single one of you today and I said, how is your love for Jesus? We'd probably have a lot of different answers. A lot of different answers. And then the last one is this. Christians got to hold on to each what? You want to know something we have left behind in the last 12 months? That's it right there. That's it right there. That is it. Jesus said, love your neighbor as as yourself. Christian fellowship is one of the most integral parts of being in the family of God. And let me ask you, how much does your church family mean to you? How much does this mean to you? We worship together. We pray together, we learn God's Word together, we celebrate together, we cry together, we rejoice together, we help each other. Every single one of us has a part to play in the family of God. Amen? We have to hold on to each other. Jesus says, you remain in me and you will bear much fruit. But Christ also knew the consequences of not abiding in him. Now this comes, here comes some scary. Are you ready? Jesus makes three statements about the unattached branch that speaks volumes. Number one, he says the unattached branch is what? By itself. It means that it is no longer attached to the vine. It is by itself. And Jesus makes it clear that there is no life and there is no fruit in life apart from him. Philippians 4.13, everybody's favorite Bible verse. I can do all things through him who what? Who strengthens me. But these verses tell us that the unattached branch can do nothing apart from Jesus. Nothing. Jesus is basically saying that these branches will continue to look for purpose in life. Meaning and significance, but will never be filled because it's a man-made filling. And not a feeling that is given by the true vine. I wonder how many of us have chased that type of fruit. Amen? How many times have we chased purpose in life and said, God, I'm just going to leave you behind. Lord, I'm going to chase it in wealth. I'm going to chase it in relationships. I'm going to chase it in careers. I'm going to chase it in hobbies. And then you find yourself jumping from one to the what? Never fulfilled, but always looking. And that's what people do. He goes on to say, number two, the unattached branch can't bear fruit. And see, I think Jesus, what he's talking about here is spiritual fruit. 
The unattached branch can't produce righteousness fruit that is acceptable to God. It won't produce character that's acceptable to God. It won't bear converts to the saving grace of God. And and long as it's done apart from God, Jesus says, you'll never do nothing apart from me. Romans 3.10 says this, as it's written, there is no one that's righteous, not even what? Not even one. And then number three, he said the unattached branch is, it's doomed. It's doomed. Now, this is what we don't like to talk about, right? This is where we kind of like to leave this away. But Jesus says the unattached branch, it is thrown away, it withers, and it's thrown into the fire, and it's what? And it's burned. Now, now many times after a storm has come through, people go out, and what do we do? We collect branches that have fallen off trees. We typically put them in a pile, and then we what? And then we burn them because there's just no use for them. But the major difference is that those branches, they were torn off in a storm. They didn't choose to be torn off. The unattached branch that Jesus is referring to here in Scripture, they chose to be unattached. They chose to walk away. They chose not to pick up their cross and follow Jesus. They chose that the race was not important to their lives. Some believe there in the Old Testament from Ezekiel that maybe this is a reference when God likened Jerusalem to fruitless vines, but the New Testament also gives reference to something that you and I need to remember. Revelation 20, 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I'm going to be real, real honest with you. You, you, you ready? Brother Donnie, what do you mean? I'm telling you this. If you die without confessing Jesus as your Savior, your name is not going to be found in that book. That means you made a choice before your death not to place your faith in Jesus. And you may think to yourself, well, Brother Donnie, that's horrible. How could God ever send someone to such a doomed existence? God didn't make that choice for you. You did. You made that choice. Jesus wants you to be with him for eternity. Amen? That's why he said, I've gone to prepare a place for who? For you. But you have to admit him as your Savior. you got to believe him. Madden comes up to me Wednesday at church. He says, Daddy, he said, I want to be baptized. I said, oh, that's awesome, that's great. I said, but you got to tell me something, who's Jesus? And I said, well, why do you need Jesus? And he's, he's right there. He, he knows just enough to be dangerous, amen? But he's not quite there yet. I said, you got to know it. you got to confess it, and you got to believe it, son. And he's right there. He's right there at that point. It's scary to think that some that identify with the church that seem to follow Jesus, that appear to be in good standings with the church, may eventually be turned away like the one, Judas, who had already left Jesus. And then number three, branches bear fruit, display the Father's what? They display the Father's promise, His glory, and one's true what? One's true identity what promise does jesus make to the branches that remain in him he says this he says ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you now let's make sure we understand something i don't believe jesus is saying just ask for anything and it will be given unto you no i believe jesus is saying as we abide in him As we continue to draw unto Him, as our actions and thoughts become more Christ-like, we're going to find out that our prayer life evolves from selfish ambitions to prayers like this. Are you ready? Jesus, please make me more like you. Align me, Father, with your work. Align me, Father, with your will. 
Father, show me the way that I can serve. Show me ways I can be a positive influence. Show me ways I can use my testimony. Show me ways that I can love my church family and others. And Jesus also says, to this is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. When we bear spiritual fruit, it's God that gets the glory. And people notice, people see something in us. And the fruit of the Spirit, some of us know this from Galatians, it's love, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. you imagine what our nation would look like if we had more of that? Amen. Instead of people stabbing each other in the back, instead of people throwing darts from one side of the aisle to the other, what would our world look like if we were more of this? Bearing, bearing spiritual fruit. Jesus says, showing yourselves to be my disciples. When, you're say, when you say you're something, people usually confirm your words by your what? By your actions. Some may say, well, why do I have to show others that I'm a Christian? I say, why not? Jesus says we will be known by our fruits, we will be known by our love for Him, and we'll be known by our love for who? And our love for each other. So you know what? Maybe this morning it's, a, it's time for a good old pruning. Amen? Last Saturday we had a good old foot washing. Or last Sunday, I'm sorry. Maybe today it's time for a good old pruning in the house of the Lord. Pruning does not simply mean spiritual surgery, though. It's just not the removal of what is dead. It could also mean cutting away the good and the better so that we might enjoy the best. That's what pruning is. So the question that you got to ask yourself this morning is, are you bearing spiritual fruit? Are people coming to Jesus because of you? Are you living with a Christian purpose? Are people seeing a different kind of love in us? A couple of years ago at my former church, Madden's VBS teacher gave him a little plant that the kids could take home in a, in a little, little cup, basically. Well, Madden accidentally left his cup with his little plant out in the garage. So I walked by it one morning and I saw all the little branches of the small plant. They were just kind of laying over. They were puny. They were withered. And they were dying. So I thought to myself, I said, you know what? I'm going to bring that in the house. I brought it inside. I gave it some water. I put it in the sunlight. And wouldn't you know, within a day or two, it started to grow. A day or two, it started to show, show some life. It got vibrant. It got greener. It showed signs of hope and life. Church, I want to ask you this morning, what does your branch look like? What are people seeing? What's God seeing? If Christ did a fruit inspection of every single one of us this morning, what would our branches say about who we are? If he called roll today and he did a branch inspection of each and every single one of us this morning, what would be the results of that inspection for you? Would he say very much fruit? What do you say, puny? This is for you. You have a choice in this world who you're going to be. And you don't have to wait until you're 20. You don't have to wait until you're 50. You don't have to wait until you're 85, 95, or 100. You have a choice today on what kind of branch and what kind of fruit that you want to bear. And listen to me. Not making a choice is making a choice. Amen? You can't just flow through life as a Christian and say, well, I'm okay. I'm okay. I just want to stay right here, Brother Donnie. Don't, don't, don't convict me. 
Don't challenge me. Don't, don't, don't ask me. I just want to stay right here with my walk with Jesus. No. I don't cut it. Because Jesus wants you to be on fire for him. Amen. He definitely never wants to throw a branch in the fire. So this morning, as Billy comes, we have our time of invitation. God's already inspecting you. God already knows if you're a true Christian. God already knows what's going on in your heart. He already knows what's going on in your life. Let me ask you something real quick. You ready? What's a Christian that don't bear fruit? Answer that question for me. What is a Christian that does not bear good fruit? As you stand.